Well, some time ago, there was a little booklet that came out and was entitled Consider the Evidence. Now, there's a lot of people that have read this little booklet, but in case you haven't read it or seen it, I thought I would just go through it with you and uh, make you aware of what it actually says. So, with that said, let's just look at the intro. Life's most important questions should never be left to blind faith or subjective feelings. Rather, these uh, crucial issues uh, should be based on a well-supported fact and evidence, facts and evidence. Some people dismiss God, the Bible, or the Christian faith as a myth or wishful thinking without ever asking the most fundamental questions of all. Are there verifiable truths? You be the judge. The evidence requires a verdict. I am always amazed that people who are going to buy a new stereo system or a new car or even a new refrigerator will spend a great deal of time researching different magazines, looking at the consumer reports and reviews online, maybe even trying them out, and then only then, finally, select, uh, selecting the very best one for the money. But when it comes to a much more important issue of salvation and the destiny of their eternal soul, they just shrug and say, well, everybody has their own beliefs, you know. When I attended the university years ago, people would ask me, so you're a Christian? Yes. Your parents were Christians? Yes. Ah, uh, that explains it. They would say, you're a Christian because your parents are Christians. If they were Hindu or Muslim or Buddhist, that's what you would be. But that's not the real, uh, really, the question. You know, here is the real issue. If I were able to line up all the belief systems in the world and examine them and turn them on and try them out, then what faith system would I be? Now, one day a famous Bible teacher in America named Harry Ironside was preaching out in the streets in Central California. A man passed by and interrupted him, saying, Excuse me, sir, how do you explain and to an ordinary man like me to figure out the right way? There are thousands of beliefs in the world. Sir, Thousands of beliefs, Harry Ironside replied. I only know of two. The passerby was confused. Two, the man said, well, there are Buddhists, Confucius, and Hindus, and Islam, and various of Christendom. What do you mean there are only two beliefs? Ironside paused. There are those who believe they can save themselves, he noted and those who believe they need a savior. Think about it. All of the other religions of the world basically tell you that there is something you need to do to save yourselves. But the message of Christianity is actually unique in that it proclaims to people everywhere that there is a savior and his name is Jesus. As we consider these important issues, there are those who will quickly object and say, well, I don't believe in God. Well, let's face it. There are many reasons that people give for rejecting the belief in God. Maybe they experienced a loss uh, of a loved one early in life, or they were disappointed or betrayed by a religious person, or maybe somehow uh, think that modern science has made the idea of God primitive or unnecessary. It could also be that their lifestyle choices uh, make the idea of an ultimate authority and judge a bit uncomfortable. And so in many of these cases, 
it is just easier to say to uh, easier for them to say god does not exist but that's like saying gravity doesn't exist a person uh could say i don't see gravity so gravity does not exist but the weight of evidence is uh invisible gravity is conclusive and convincing likewise the weight of evidence for god from science logic and morality is beyond overwhelming it is because of this evidence that the vast majority of people acknowledge god's existence including the majority of science scientists and the intelligence uh science our science points to God. In the early to mid 20th century, scientific discoveries were causing atheists a great deal of discomfort. Undeniable um, observational and mathematical evidence demonstrated that the university is not eternal, but rather that it began at a, a moment in time in the past. Uh, those, though the uh, phase in some me means of poking fun at the discovery, soon people began to call this uh, creation event the Big Bang. Now, interestingly, it was atheist atheistic science who initially rejected the Big Bang because it sounded exactly like the biblical creation account of the book of Genesis. In the first few verses of the Bible, we read that of God who existed outside of space and time, created a material universe out of nothing, which is exactly what the data from the various of sources confirm. Over time, the case for a non-eternal uh, universe overcame nearly all objections. Uh, with evidence from uh, starlight redshift, which proved a rapid expanding universe, uh, COBE, background radiation measurements and the implication of Einstein's relativity, as demonstrated by the astrophysics uh, George uh, Lamarat, who traced these moving galaxies back to a single point of origin. The evidence is clear. The universe was created out of nothing, and the universe is not eternal. Famous uh, theological uh, physicist Alexander uh, Velkant noted, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, Robert Jastra an uh, astronomical physicist at NASA, uh, Goddard University of Space Studies, said this, uh, ast astronomers uh, now find that they have painted themselves into a corner because they have proven by their own methods that the world began abruptly in an act of creation that there is a supernatural force at work and is is now, I think, a scientific proven fact. Quantum chemist Henry F. Schaefer III, five times nominee for the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, offered this. A creator must exist. The Big Bang ripple and sequentially scientific findings are clearly pointing to an ex nihilo creation consisting of the first five verses of the book of Genesis. 
uh, a cosmologist, continued to study the universe, new and startling discoveries further point to the existence of a superintelligence uh, which created the cosmos. Rather than finding chaos and a blind chance, they discovered that the universe is governed by a precisely selected uh, constants within physics and uh, chemistry. If any of these values vary by even the tiniest fraction of, uh, of a fraction, they would be no planets, no stars, definitely no life. Once again, science proves, logically, there must be an intelligent creator capable of level of universal uh, super engineering. With regards to this fine-tuning, Professor Steve Weinberg, uh, noble uh, linguist of high-energy physics, uh, wrote the following in a scientific American journal. Now, surprisingly, it is that the laws of nature and of the initial condition of the universe should allow for the existence of being who could observe it. Life, we know, it would be impossible if anyone of several uh, physical uh, qualities have slightly different values. With physics and chemistry concluded points to the intelligent creator, uh, it would only a matter of time before molecular uh, biology, biology would yield its own mountains of evidence for God. In the early 1950s, researcher uh, Walson and uh, Crick announced the uh, formal discovery of the double hex molecular known as a DNA. In the decades that followed, analysts of the unimaginable complex information storage system has revealed that the physical life cannot be the result of random chance, mutation, and simple uh, chemical uh, attractions, as was once believed. Life requires thousands of highly complex uh, functional uh, protons, and that the mathematical odds of just even one of these arriving by chance is effectively zero. One researcher puts it this way, the amount of time it would take uh, for the form an average functional proton by chance is the amount of time it would take for an ambiguous traveling at the breakneck speed of one foot per year to transport each atom in the known universe all the way across the universe, 30 billion light years, and then travel back to pick up the next atom and so on until it had transported every single atom, roughly 10 to the 80th power atoms, and that, and then it would have to repeat this process for 56 billion more universe, uh, universes to exhaust ambiguous would travel for about, and I can't even pronounce this number, it's so large. Obviously, this proves that the statistics impossible, impossible to explain uh, functional protein by natural process. And even if just one function, uh, functional protein, somehow formed life required thousands of these, and each is very different from each of the highly complex 
Well, to put it uh, in an allegory, imagine hearing that Fred Smith from down the street just won the Powerball lottery. You would uh, confidently say Fred was lucky, and you would be right. Now, the odds of winning a Powerball is roughly about 1 in 30 million. But now imagine hearing that very next week that the very same Fred Smith won the very next Powerball. Right away, you would suspect that something was up. And once again, you'd be right. You would instantly refer to he is probably working with someone on the inside because the odds seem too great against this being a luck of the draw. Now, what if Fred won three weeks in a row? I Surely, a quick criminal investigation would be open to find these responsible for rigging the system. And only way these kinds of chances to find odds can be overcome is for the intelligent agent to engineer this kind of a result. But now, just try to imagine that the same Fred Smith wins the next 1,000 Powerballs in a row. Impossible, you would exclaim, and again, you would be right because the mathematical law of probability reveals that this could never happen by chance. Likewise, the odds of just one fractional protein uh, forming, formed by chance is like Fred Smith winning the Powerball lottery over and over and over and over again. It will not and cannot happen by chance and natural chemis chemical properties. It must have been engineered intelligently. The non-Christian scientist Paul Davis admits, we now know that the secret of life lies not with the chemical ingredients but with the logical structure of organization arrangement of the molecules. Like the supercomputer, life is an informational processing system. It is the software of the living cells that is really a mystery, not the hardware. Then he poses the question that has never been answered by the scientific discoveries. How did stupid atoms spontaneously write their own software. Some people think that they have found a winning move in the origin of life's game by avoiding the God piece altogether. They will pose, well, life was engineered on Earth by aliens. But putting this new alien piece on the board doesn't do anything to solve the original problem. Why? because it still needs a superintelligence that is capable of creating the complex aliens. The law of cause and effect says that whoever created the aliens has to be even more complex and intelligent than the aliens themselves. Claiming aliens created mankind only pushes the origin issue back one square and is not even close to a checkmate. Well, after considering these various difference, yet uh, covering lines of evidence, Cambridge University uh, astrophysics and a mathematician, uh, Sir Frederick Holton, sums up the conclusive case for God from science with the important observation. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that the superintelligence has uh, monkeyed with the physics as well as with the chemistry and uh, biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature 
the number one calculation from the facts seems to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond questions. Now the logical point to God. The vast majority of people look out at the incre incredible order and beauty of the universe and realize that logically someone had to, in to intelligently, uh, intentionally create all, all of this from giraffes to galaxies, from ecosystem to solar system, the intrigant design of the universe is impossible to miss. Think about it. No one would look at the four faces carefully carved in the granite in Mount Rushmore and say, look, nobody made that. It just is a coincidence of time, chance, and erosion. No, no one would look at the famous paintings such as the Mosa, Mo, Mo Lisa and say, nobody painted that. It just a uh, uh, coincidence of time, chance, and chemical staining. Neither of these statements would be logical. Why? Because we understand cause and effect. Effect such as Mount Rushmore and the Mona Lisa are the result of intelligent causes, people. When it comes to the creation of the universe, we can look at it logically as well. A logical approach would be organizing like this. Everything which begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Logically, there must have been the first cause. Logical detection that there has to be something first that then leads to everything else. Think of every event that has happened in the entire history of the universe, such as a huge line of dominoes going back to the distant past. Now, if you go back far enough, and you have to come to the very first action that made the very first domino fall, logic also demands that the first cause must have always existed. In other words, the first cause must be eternal, or else it could not have been there to tip the first domino. Though, through, though not obser observant, uh, at first, the first cause of creation, creator must also be personal. Why? For two important reasons. First, the universe was created at a specific point in time. It is not eternally old. It is first cause of the universe was merely to set conditions that were always right for causing the Big Bang. Then the universe would have been caused an eternal eternity ago. But obviously, science affirms, uh, affirmationally says, no, the universe is not eternally old. Since the universe did not come into being uh, an eternity ago, then it implies there was an intentional decision to create it at a certain point in time, and only personally be, being can make actual decisions. Secondly, the first cause must be personal because the universe consist of personal beings, you and me. And in personal university, uh, universe cannot give rise to intelligence and personal beings because that would violate the basic uh, tenets of the law of cause and effect. 
So putting it all together from science and logic, whatever leads to the creation of the universe has to be eternal, powerful, intelligent, and personal. If you were to ask the average person, what am I describing? It is something eternal, powerful, intelligent, and personal? They would instantly respond, God. Now, moral points, morality points to God. Guilt is a multi-billion dollar business that offers the psychiatrists and counselors worldwide to fill with people struggling to deal with the consequences of their own bad decisions. Likewise, jails and prisons are packed with criminals. Why? It is about the existence of right and wrong. Since the dawn of human history, we have been aware of a set of moral obligations, a set of actions that either should be done or should not be done, with very few exceptions. This moral law is universally understood. But how could this non-material set of rules be explained by mere chemistry or biology? Uh, uh, nitrogen and oxygen and uh, and amo uh, animo uh, ammonia acid do not care about stealing or lying or rapes. It is obviously an objective morality, cannot be explained by the cha changing wind of social pressure since basic moral rules have remained fairly consistent for thousands of years across all cultures. It also cannot be the product of evolution because morality often encourages good behavior that has nothing to do with making us or the species more biologically fit for survival or successful in the long run. If evolution could somehow magically grant us morality, then it is possible that at some point in the future, uh, torturing babies for fun or murder or rape could become morally good. But we know intrinsically that this is ridiculous. That will never happen. Why? Because morality is objective. It is the law outside of us that it doesn't change simply because society and biochemistry changes. Some people believe that morality is purely subjective, meaning that there is no actual right or wrong in the universe, but that each person or group decides what is right or wrong. The story is told of a a uh, uh, physical professor who announced that the next exam would be an essay. The students were to write a paper defining their position as either believing in a subjective uh, morality or uh, objective morality. A few days later, he made the following announcement. Every paper that was written by someone claiming to believe a subjective morality gets an F, and everyone gets an A. Uh, several of the students who had written in favor of sub sub subjective morality, which stunned an objection to his method of grading that is not fair, they complained. This wise professor smiled and said, Oh, so you don't actually believe in subjective morality. He was right. They were caught in their own delusion. They objected on the grounds that his method were not fair which, of course, is an objective standard. People love to claim that 
morality is subjective. That is, until they are the victim of some moral infraction of crime, and they suddenly they switch to objective morality in their assertion. It is like claiming that the physical laws, like gravity, are merely subjective and open to personal interpretation. Good luck holding that philosophy, that as you step off the roof of a tall building, asserting that you will float. Regardless of what you feel or think, you will fall because physically, physical laws are objective, and the same is true of moral laws. How we feel does not in any way influence physical or moral laws. We all have an inner moral referee called a conscience. This important guide warns us when, we dangerous, when we're dangerously close to moral boundaries or it bothers us when we may have crossed one. Now we ain't forcing, forced to obey it, but God still programmed it within us as we, uh, as an internal witness to his standards. And to be sure that there are certain uh, uh, social standards which might adjust slightly over time, like vulgar language or modesty, but no uh, regional personal experience, rape and murder to become good deeds at any time in the future. Paul Copan, uh, PhD, professor of uh, analytic philosophy noted, it's extremely difficult to see how we move from the Big Bang to the moral responsibility. Human beings, if not just material beings, produced by a material universe, then object values or goodness can't be accounted for. It is the basic concept, if there is an objective moral law, then logically insist that there must be a moral lawgiver. Logically, the only cause capable of explaining the uh, effect of moral uh, morality is must be God. Science points to God's existence. Logic demands God's existence, and morality requires God's existence. The nagging question, the conglomerate case for God is inclusive, but there is one issue that needs to be addressed, known as the problem of evil. This challenge dates back to the ancient Greeks. It goes something like this. If God is good and God created everything, then why is there evil in the world? The answer is so simple that we often miss it. God is good, but God did not create everything. Thing, think. God did create all the physical realities, the universe and its laws, but he did not make evil because evil is not a thing. God created people with free wills. We are not robots, and the people have the free will to choose to do evil or good, and these actions can and do affect other people. So to put it simply, evil is the result of people using their free will to choose to do selfish and sinful acts. So there is a, this brings up another important question. If free will is a cause of evil, then why does God allow it? The short answer, love. 
Love, you ask? Yes, love. The only way that we can have a real relationship with our Creator based on love is for us to have a choice. We must have the ability to freely love or freely not to love. We must have free will that can say yes to God or it can say no to God. If God had created us as robots, the endless uh, repeated, I love God, I love God, then it could, it is not a truly loving relationship. It would be forced fake. But thankful we are not robots. God is willing to temporarily allow evil in the world since it allows for much greater good for all of time and eternity true love. But someone will then ask, how about other types of evil, like disease or hurricanes or earthquakes? You can't blame people for those. Actually, the Bible tackles that important question too. It reveals that the original creation of the world was without sickness and natural disasters. It was only after mankind rebelled against God that he caused or allowed natural sufferings in the world. But why? The Bible explains that God allows suffering and discomfort to lead people to the realization of the need of him and ultimately their need of salvation. Sickness and pain reminds us that something is wrong and what is wrong is you and me. We have rebelled and sinned against our own creator and he sent reminders of our dire condition by those uncomfortable messages. Just imagine a bizarre world in which uh, fatal cancer never had any symptoms. A person could be affected with an unknown terminal uh, tumor and just drop dead one day with absolutely no warning or sign. But it is when we e experience symptoms that we seek out medical care and diagnose, diagnostics and deal with our health problems. Now let's be honest, we have a far more dangerous condition than terminal cancer. We have a sinful condition that will ultimately separate us from our God for all eternity, if not treated. But God, in his goodness, sent us symptoms or reminders of our terminal condition. In order for us to seek his care, we must face it. Death is certainly to do all, and suffering along the way is a severe mercy uh, to cause us to reach out to God to repent, which means to turn back to him. So suffering is the life of absolute and justified, and justified because it can lead to a much greater good, our repentance and restoration to the right relationship with our God. C.S. Lewis, the author of the popular Chronicles of Narnia, was once a dedicated atheist, but after examining the evidence, he became a devoted follower of Jesus. Regardless, regarding the subject of human suffering, he wrote the following, God whispers to us in our uh, pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his uh, megaphone to rouse the deaf world. I'll admit, it is easy to just live life, to take things for granted and simply ignore God. But God, in his goodness, shouts in our pain. 
he is constantly trying to wake us up to mo our most urgent need of salvation so that we can be saved from the eternal penalty of our sins and rebellion. Sin is a disease. Suffering is a symptom of salvation through Jesus is the cure. The unique book speaks of the Bible and its answer to the difficulties, difficult questions. There are many people who will say, well, the Bible is just another holy book. There are many other books like it, you, you know. Now, the people who make this type of claim haven't done their homework. When they come to uh, the religious book, the Bible is absolutely unique because it or not, it is or not, the, the Bible is the only sacred text in the world that contains hundreds of details accurate and uh, variable, ver verifiable, fulfilled prophecy. The, in fact, out of the 32,000 verses in the Bible, approximately 8,000 of these verses refer to events still yet future when those particular verses were being written. Just let that sink in. No less than 25% of the Bible is uh, a, a prophecy. This in, incredible fact alone renders it unique among the religious texts. We can all make predictions, and we usually do, and it's based on trends. For instance, we could look at a performance of a certain uh, soccer team and then predict that they may win the next World Cup. But that is a prediction based on trends, not on facts. But prophecy is far different. For example, to use the same sport analogy, prophecy would be like someone over a thousand years ago writing about a yet future game called soccer. Long before that modern game is ever invented. And that is the year 2026, the Brazilian men team will win the two, go uh, two golds over the team from France. Then in 2026, it actually happens. That is what the Bible, Bible prophecy is like. You know, the biblical uh, prophets spake of things so remote and so distant into the future that no amount of trends and uh, tr uh, trends analyzed or good luck guesses could ever explain their perfect track record. Only God knows the future uh, per perfectly and fulfills prophecy in an undeniable way to verify that the content of the Bible must be driven in their origin. People can predict, but only God can prophesy. No other holy book in the world except for the Bible contains hundreds of details, accurate and verifiable for full prophecy. None of the Hindu Valdais in nor the uh, Balagrave Gita or the Quran or the Haitith, nor the Book of Mormons, nor the uh, Malan calendar, even the famous uh, predictions of Nostradamus fail because they are only vague, short poems that rarely speak of any person or event with any specific details. In addition, many of the clear predictions of the French mystics may turn out to be completely false. Only the Bible contains fulfilled prophecy. 
Now, just as science, logic, and morality point uh, conclusively to God's existence, fulfilled prophecy in the Bible point uh, conclusively to God's authority. Only the Bible uh, is one unified message of God's love and plan of salvation for us, even though it is comprised of 66 different books written by at least 40 human authors over a 1,600-year period in two primary languages and across three continents. Now, only the Bible reveals the origin of mankind, free will, sin, and evil, and the reason for why God allows human suffering. Only the Bible reveals God's uh, provision to solve our sin problem by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. He provide, provided a Savior who died in our place to pay the penalty that each of us deserves because of our rebellion. Fulfill prophecy about the Savior. The overall message of the Bible centers around God's love for rebellious mankind. It focuses on his plan to provide a free gift of salvation through the sacrificial death of the Messiah. Obviously, the identifying of the promised Savior is crucial. Now, why or what God did for us uh, so that we could uh, authenticate the message and identify of uh, identity of Jesus as the provided Savior was that hundreds of years before Jesus ever came into the world, God painted a portrait in words through the biblical prophets that would describe the birth, life, death, and resurrection of the Messiah when he did come. For instance, how would the Messiah Savior die? The sacrificial death of Jesus was prophesied by many of the prophets, uh, uh, the prophetic writings in the pages of the Old Testament long before he was ever born. Now, we would expect that he would die by stoning since that was the traditional form of execution by the Jewish leaders for well over a thousand years, and Jesus was a Jew living in Israel. But no, says the biblical prophets, his death will be very different. They will pierce his hands and his feet. Hands and feet being pierced, well, we know very well that that means that is crucifixion, the cruel method of execution adopted by the Romans, but clearly not the method used by the Jews. But this amazing prophecy gets even better. The description of the crucifixion of Jesus in Psalms 22 was written about a thousand years before Jesus was nailed hands and feet to the cross. Even more astonishing, this uh, ver uh, verifiable prophecy described the Messiah's crucified more than 700 years before crucifixion was e invented. Imagine someone writing a, in great detail about the electric chair execution, not just 10 years ago or 50 years ago, but around 700 years ago, before electricity was even discovered. Where would the Messiah be born? The prophet Micah penned that the Savior would be born in Bethlehem, Judea, one of the most insignificant villages of all of Israel. He penned this incredible prophecy 750 years before Jesus was born in a humble stable in the town of Bethlehem, Judea. Small and and even large towns become and they come and go. All of time 
may disappear into the dustbin of forgotten history, but this prophecy said that the Savior would be born into the smallest town in the entire country. And then it happened 750 years later. It is nearly a miracle that the town still exists, and it is a defined miracle that the Savior was indeed born there. If it were merely a prediction, the prophet surely would have picked a larger and enduring city such as Jerusalem. But in effect, God said, no, not majestic Jerusalem, but the insignificant Bethlehem. What would be the circumstances of the Messiah's betrayal? <clears throat> the Old Testament prophets made it clear that the Messiah would be rejected by the Jewish leadership. They go on to tell us that he was ultimately to be betrayed by a member of his own inner circle for a specific sum of silver. Even non-Christians are aware of Judas Isaria, one of the first disciples of Jesus, who paid in silver to betray the Savior with the famous peck on the cheek. On the very night before the crucifixion, now 2,000 years later, we still refer to, decept to this deceptive act as a betrayal of Judas' kiss. Since Judas bargained with the Jews, Jewish leadership to betray Jesus, one would assume that the agreed upon a price would be 50 pieces of silver, which was the required amount according to the Jewish law. No, said the biblical prophet hundreds of years before, the Messiah will be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Now, isn't that an astonishing fact? The very same people who were trying to disprove the Messiahship of Jesus knew about the exact prophecy, and all the Jewish leaders had to do was to disqualify Jesus from being the promised Messiah was to pay uh, thir uh, 29 pieces of silver or 31 pieces of silver, and then he could not have been the Messiah. And yet the rulers paid the 30 pieces of silver, just as the prophets had foretold, and then sealed the exact amount of money they paid into the public record. There are some things you just can't arrange. One of the most important topics in the Old Testament is the exact lineages or the genealogy of the coming Messiah. Many of the biblical prophets declared that the Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah and Israel and that specifically he would be a direct descendant of King David. The prophet Isaiah announced that the Savior would be miraculously born to a virgin. The prophet Daniel spoke of the exact timing of the Messiah's coming over 500 years before it happened, and that the Messiah would be executed. Now just think about all of these for a moment. You try to arrange the small town you were born in. You try to arrange the family line that you would belong to. You try to arrange the uh, identified and the statue of your own mother. You try to uh, exact time uh, of your arrival. You try to arrange the method of your own execution, and you try to arrange your own resurrection from the dead. Now, I suggest that all of this would be a bit difficult to do. Actually, it would be impossible. But believe it or not, some frigid skeptics try to claim that Jesus was a regular guy who set out to fulfill these prophecies to gain the first century following. Are they just ignorant and indisputable fact that dozens of these prophets six announcements uh, 
would be impossible for anyone to fulfill by their own actions? And who would want to fulfill a prophecy of being crucified? You would experience one of the most horrifying, painful deaths known to mankind, and then your Messiah act would be over permanently. These are just a few examples of fulfilled prophecy about Jesus, the Savior of the world. There are hundreds of them in the Bible, hundreds, and they have been some skeptics who have tried to claim that the Old Testament prophets were written after the events. They said that is why the prophecy is so accurate. It's because they were written after the event happened. But this chance discovery in Israel in 1947 silenced the stubborn claims. In the uh, series of remote caves near the Dead Ski, an Arab shepherd found dozens of ancient Hebrew scrolls and thousands of the scroll fragments. Uh, scientific investigation of these documents reveal that these were copies of every single Old Testament book except for Esther. And careful analyzing revealed that many of them dated well into the third century before Jesus was even born. These documents were nearly a thousand years older than the best Hebrew scriptures at that at the time. But when these far more ancient texts were compared with the modern Hebrew copies. They were nearly identical. The difference were minor and insequential. You know, skeptics of the Bibles were stunned and dismayed. These biblical uh, critics have been claimed since about the middle of the 19th century that we couldn't trust the Bible because the text had been edited and altered over the past 2,000 years, but these critics were proven wrong. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls prove that not only had the scriptures not changed over the last 2,000 years, but also that the Old Testament prophecies were written long before the events of the people that had spoken of. The scriptures contained prophecies of the future, not news reports of the past. Aerospace engineer once examined just 69 of the specific prophecies about the coming Messiah uh, given in the Old Testament. Now, he calculated that the odds of Jesus fulfilling these 69 prophecies was only one chance in 5.32 times 10 to the 72nd power. To put it into perspective, imagine convincing the entire mass of the known universe into grains of sand. Now, let's say that you paint just one of these grains of sands with green paint and then hide it and then hid that one grain, uh, green grain somewhere in the universe. What would be the odds that a blindfold person traveling anywhere in the universe could step out of a spaceship and by chance pick up your one painted grain of sand on the very first try. Let's be very honest, it would never happen. Believe it or not, the million, million blind person would be one million uh, times more likely to find that one green grain of sand by chance than Jesus Christ to fulfill the 69 of the prophecies. Oh, friends, you've got to do something with that. You have a free will, and you can choose to ignore the evidence, but if you will examine the Bible, which claims to be the Word of God nearly 4,000 times, you will discover that unlike any other religions in the world, 
God has taken your brain seriously. He has given you hard evidence to believe. God never asks us to for blind faith, but he does encourage us to have informed trust. God has given us multiple lines of convincing evidence that Jesus has proven himself to be the long-awaited promised Messiah. The facts are there. Mathematical probabilities don't lie. Christianity is the only belief system in the world that gives you evidence in history and science and logic and morality to authenticate its trustfulness. Now, what about the resurrection? Fulfilled prophecy is powerful and conclusive evidence that the Bible is the word of God and that Jesus really is the savior of the world. But God has also proven another irrefutable proof of the identified of the uh, Messiah, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Over and over again in the first books of the New Testament, Jesus announces to his disciples that he will be crucified and then he will be miraculously resurrected on the third day. Of course, anybody can claim that they will raise from the dead, but it is quite another thing to actually do it. And it can be verified with great certainty that Jesus actually did it. We have numerous eyewitnesses testimonies of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have the testimony of the empty tomb. We have the written record of the Jewish leadership at the time claiming that the disciples of Jesus merely stole his body from the tomb. But how did they overpower the trained Roman guards at the tomb? People can try to deny the resurrection of Jesus but it is impossible to deny the fact that almost every single one of the apostles of Jesus died a martyr's death while still claiming that Jesus really did raise from the dead. Just think about that. If Christianity is a lie, it was the apostles who created the lie. The apostles and their associates were the ones who wrote all the New Testament. The apostles were the ones who went out and claimed that Jesus rose from the dead. The apostles were rejected by their own people, often arrested, beaten, and untimely killed because of their faith in the resurrected Christ. Why would anyone die for a lie that they created? Many religious people of various faiths, such as the 9-11 Muslim hijackers, have died for what they believe to be true. But if Jesus did not raise from the dead, then the apostles were fools because they died for what they knew to be false. That is ludicrous. In the face of horrible rejection and the threat of death, Surely, at least one of them would have broken down. Surely, at least one of them would have said, Okay, okay, we made it all up, it's true. But none of them did that, not even one. You know, the 9-11 Muslim hijackers died for a, a particular Islamic belief. But these 19 hijackers did not invent Islam. They did not know the Islam was actually true or false. They could not know whether Muhammad was real, really a true prophet of God, because he lived about 1,500 years ago. They never met him or anyone who actually knew him. Those hijackers merely believed what they had been told and read. But the apostles of Jesus were there at the beginning. They witnessed the life, the miracles, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. 
if Christianity were all a lie, then those men went to a horrible death for a false religion that they had fabricated. But it is, isn't a lie. The apostles were willing to die because Jesus had really raised from the dead. Now, what about heaven and hell? It is hard to escape the fact that God exists and is overwhelming evidence says, yes, he did, does. And if the Bible is his word and the overwhelming evidence says, yes, it is, then there is an afterlife. You and I will not cease to exist when we die physically. No, no, no. We are made in the image of God and our souls and our true self, the actual me and you, will continue to live on forever. This means that the place called heaven and hell are real places where real people will, re will live forever. But who goes to heaven and who goes to hell? Some people think that good people go to heaven and that bad people go to hell, but that is not all at all what God says. Some people think that if they do good deeds in certain situations that they will get a credit with God to somehow overcome the bad things that they have done. They think that the good deeds can erase the bad uh, deeds. But a simple illustration will reveal why that is impossible. Imagine that our friend Fred Smith had been arrested for murder. Uh, there are multitude, a multitude eyewitnesses, and he even confesses to committing the horrible crime. Fred stands before the bench. The judge peers down at him and asks, How do you plead? Fred looks up and replies, I am completely guilty, Your Honor. I killed my neighbor, but I have decided to change, and I am going to donate money to charity, and I am going to help the elderly neighbors. Uh, by mowing their grass, and I am going to start going to church and helping other people. The criminal smiles and starts moving for the courtroom exit. He glances back at the judge. Am I free to go, right? He asked. Is he free to go? No, absolutely not. He is a guilty criminal. No amount of good deeds that he will do in the future can erase the fact that he has murdered someone in the past. Just because you tell the truth tomorrow doesn't erase the fact that you have told a lie yesterday or last week or last year. We may forget our own evil and sins, but God has a perfect memory. The candy bar that I stole in the seventh grade I might have slipped off my radar for years, but to God that evil act is as fresh as my last breath. Now some people might object to say, oh, give me a break. I think I'm a pretty good person. Listen, my friend, you don't even come up to your own standards, let alone God's. Here is what God says about our attempts to cover up our sin by attempting to be good people. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, in other words, by seeking to live a good life and by keeping the Ten Commandments or attempting to live by the golden rule, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Romans 3.20. That ends all arguments. God himself, the perfect judge of the entire universe, says that good deeds will not somehow make you justified or righteous 
in his sight. To be in heaven, we must have a perfect righteousness, but we have sinned, all of us. Sin isn't only a terrible thing like murder or rape. It is any breaking of God's laws. Everybody falls short of God's standards. And even if we never sin again, from now until we die, we still have done evil things in the past like lust, hate, and pride. But there is a good news. No matter how wicked the sinner you are, no matter how good we think we are, God has made an offer to the entire human race, to those who find the way to heaven, blocked because of their own sin and failure, have kept them from meeting God's perfect standards, there is truly an alternative. It is not my righteousness or your righteousness that can save us. It is God's righteousness, and we can receive it as a gift through trusting in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Only God is perfect, and he is willing to give sinners his perfect righteousness freely. Think about it. Christianity is the only belief system in the world that lets you be truly honest with God about your sins and failure. He isn't expecting you to hide your flaws or ignore them and cover them up. Uh, with rit rituals or religion, but that is exactly what most people are doing. Using religion to try to make themselves somehow worthy of heaven, which is impossible. But when we try to cover up our sin by good deeds, it's like putting a bandage over a bullet wound. We may not see the injury but it's still there. Imagine texting someone who desperately tried to get to heaven by their own good works, rituals, and religion. The conversation will probably be quite a bit like this picture. And just looking at this picture, uh, how are you doing? Oh, not bad. Oh, really? Not bad? Doing pretty good. Doing my best. Oh, you are. I've never met someone who does their best, even by their own standards. Now, God never asks you uh, to pretend that you're okay. He wants you to be honest with him about your sins. God isn't waiting for you to clean up your life before you feel worthy to come to him. He says, come to me now and then i will take care of the rest my child this is important and you may not believe me at first but it's true christianity isn't the only belief system in the world that offers you a savior hindus islam doesn't offer a savior they say save yourself you do it yourself. There, theirs are a do-it-yourself religion, and all of the other religions of the world fall under the same do-it-yourself category. You do it, and if you do it well enough, well then, you might get to heaven. And as long as you think that you can save yourself, than I guess any religion will do. But when you realize that you are a sinner and that you can't save yourself and that you need a savior, the list is very short. There is only one savior and his name is Jesus. You can't save yourself. Now, save yourself is an absolute ludicrous statement. If you're in a burning building and you are screaming out the window, help, save me, save me, 
and I'm walking by, and I say, oh, save yourself. Listen, if you could save yourself, then you don't need to be saved. But you can't save yourself. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the debt that you and I owed to God because of our evil and rebellion. And in exchange for your sin, he is offering you the righteousness, his righteousness, as a gift. He offers us the free exchange. You see, Jesus lived a perfect life, and so therefore he had no sin debt of his own. When he freely gave up his life for each of us, he had perfect credit with God. A perfect man died so that the imperfect people like you, like us, could be saved. When Jesus died for you, it was just as if you died. Jesus was our perfect substitute. Most of us have had a substitute teacher. Maybe our regular teacher was sick, and so our new teacher is temporarily replacing the substitute teacher uh, fill in. They were the true place of the normal teacher. That is what Jesus did for us. He was our substitute. He stood in our place and died as our sacrifice. And now, because of Jesus' sacrifice in our place, God can freely offer his forgiveness and his righteousness as a free gift to those willing to admit their sins and their need of a Savior. God says that you can stop trying to cover up your sin with good deeds and that you don't have to engage in religious rituals to make his love you. He already loves you. The most famous verse in the Bible is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that so that whoever trusts in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Now God loves you unconditionally, but that does not mean that automatically everyone will be in heaven. Salvation is a gift that must be received, and God knows the true love is based upon our ability to say yes or no to his offer of a relationship. We cannot earn it or buy it or be worthy of it. It's something that he offers for free. Salvation is not something you earn. Salvation is a gift. Every other religion ultimately says that when you stand before God, you're desperately hoping that he will, he's going to bend the rules just a bit to let you into heaven. I guarantee that there is no follower of any religion that says, when I stand before God someday, I'm going to say to him, okay, God, here's your challenge. Put my life up on the side then put your perfect law up on the other side. And I challenge you to find every one thing wrong with my life. Is that what people are going to say? Not at all. They are hoping against hope that somehow they're going to just slip in. Maybe in the top half percent or so. They're hoping that just maybe they're going to get in. That is, if God won't be too careful at examining their life, and or maybe he will ignore his own standards from time to time. Is there any hope then? If only perfect people make it in, then how can I hope to ever make it in to heaven, you ask. Well, 
Oh, says God, there, what we will do. I'll transfer your sin debt to my son Jesus, and then he will pay it in full for you. God's perfect standard is the law, but we have all broken it. So God hands over the bill, but then he pays it himself through Christ our substitute. As condemned sinners against God, we could do nothing to make it right. Uh, so God himself provide a, provided a Savior. Imperfect people like you and me can be made perfect through the perfect Savior. Well, it's time to make a decision. Examine the evidence. Not only the evidence of science, logic, and morality, not only the evidence of the Bible and the fulfilled prophecy, but the evidence in your own heart, the evidence deep down that reminds us that we are sinners and that we all need a Savior. Examine the evidence that says you can't save yourself, the evidence which insists God's deeds don't erase bad, good deeds don't obey, uh, erase bad deeds. Then consider the Bible has to say about the Lord Jesus, the Savior of sinners. He came to die upon the cross to save you. The Bible simply declares, but God provided his own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. And then be honest with God about your sin. That's what the Bible calls repentance when we freely admit that we are guilty and that we are willing to turn away from the sin and to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior of sinners. In his word, God says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23 We know what wages are. Wages are something we earn, like a paycheck at our last job. If we work a certain number of hours, then we earn a certain amount of money. Likewise, God says that when we sin, we are earning judgment, eternal hell. But thankfully, he also says, that he would rather give us a free gift that we did not earn. The Bible says that, the, that right now is the time to be saved. God calls out, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 We are not promised even one more minute of life in this world. A car accident and atheism or random violence could end each of our lives without warning. About 180,000 people die every day. That's two people each second. By the time you finish reading this booklet, perhaps over 5,000 people will have died since you first uh, cracked open the cover or started to listen to this audio. We may miss an appointment with the doctor, but our appointment with death will be kept right on schedule, except that none of us know the exact day or hour. God is waiting to save you. Now is the time. Right now, in your heart, cry out to him, O oh God, I don't know why you would want me to. Uh, I'm a sinner. I'm damaged goods. But in your love, you said that whoever comes to you, you would never cast out. Take me now. Save me now. I give up. I will accept the free gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen.
Thank you for reading or listening to this booklet.